Have you ever gone round to someone else's house for a dinner party and felt a strange sense of unease? Interactions might begin rather awkward and stilted, and as the drinks begin to flow, people relax a little. They let their guards down, secrets start to come out, and you soon realise how little you know certain people sat around that dinner table with you. From as far back as the old dark house in 1932, the horror genre has relished putting a bunch of strangers around a dinner table in an old isolated house and let the awkward and often horrific interactions play out. But no films have done this more powerfully in recent years than Karen Kusama's The Invitation in 2015 and Christian Daftrup's Speak No Evil in 2022. Both films begin as low-key pot-boiler character dramas, and both end in some of the most gut-wrenching and disturbing horror scenes of the 21st century. <laughs> Join me as we continue exploring the evolution of home invasion and we discuss Karen Kusama's The Invitation and Christian Daftrup's Speak No Evil. Welcome back to the Evolution of Horror. My name is Mike Munzer, and as ever, I am your host. In this podcast, we explore and dissect the history and the evolution of the horror genre, one subgenre at a time. We are currently in the middle of our ninth season, exploring the evolution of home invasion, and this is part 29. This is the one I've been waiting for for a very long time because this week, as that intro suggested, we are covering two of my absolute favourite horror films of the last 20 years. The ultimate awkward dinner party horror double bill. It's The Invitation from 2015 and Speak No Evil from 2022. If you haven't seen these movies, these discussions will be spoilerific. Do yourself a favour and watch these two incredible gems before you listen to our discussion. So, joining me, I've got a brand new guest. I'm very, very excited to have her here. I've wanted her on the podcast for a very long time, so I've really made an effort. Uh, I've got dinner cooking in the kitchen. I've got my best silverware on the table. I've got some of the most expensive wine I own. And here she is. She's travelled all the way from Rue Morgue HQ in Toronto. Andrea Supersati, hello. Hello, Mike. How are you? I'm so good. I'm so good. Welcome to my dinner party. Come in, make yourself at home, have a glass of wine. How are you, Andrea? I am delighted to be here. I am delighted that you were persistent, that you were tenacious, <laughs> that you're not like all the fragile boys who, when I say I can't, I don't have time, they just disappear from my life. You yeah. hung in there. I sure You did. got me between production schedules, and here we are. You, are, Yeah, I did not give up. Uh, sorry if I I over hassled you there, Andrea, but I was very keen to get you on the podcast. So I'm so glad we could finally make it happen. And for these two films as well. Incredible. First of all, let me just ask you how I mean, obviously, you are as well as being co host of the brilliant Faculty of Horror, you are also editor of Rue Morgue. How is everything at Rue Morgue right now? Rue Morgue is doing great. We just put our uh, September October issue to bed, uh, uh-huh. which is funny because here we are talking in the middle of August. And that's kind of the <laughs> publishing world, isn't it? Is that I'm looking in my crystal ball at what's hip hop happening two, three, four months from now. Um, yeah. So yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, actually, cause people are probably gonna listen to this episode in October, I think by the time this goes out. But yes, in the it's the middle of August right now as we're discussing this. We're just on the cusp of kind of a lot of good stuff coming up and festivals coming up. Have How has it been for you in terms of the new releases this year? Cause I have been saying with a lot of friends that like, we haven't found it to be a vintage year so far for horror. There's been a handful of good stuff, but not as much this time round compared to last year. Yeah, I just got back from the Fantasia Film Festival where there were definitely a couple of bangers. You know, TIFF is coming up. Fantastic Fest is coming up. I, I think the cream of the crop has yet to uh, to rear its head. But in terms of studio horror, in terms of, uh, of horror movies that I saw in the big box cinemas this year, um, you're right. Evil Dead Rise left me dry. I'm not hearing great things about uh, Last Voyage. Um, yeah. Yeah. But you know, talk to me was a talk to me was though. amazing. Absolutely, talk to me still best of the year. I think at this point, right? Um, so let me start off by asking you, Andrea. 
As I like to ask all my new guests, what is your kind of horror origin story? Do you remember sort of how and when you first fell in love with the genre? Do you know what? I do. I remember it quite vividly. Um... I had a cousin in town, and uh, my cousin was around my age, and I was delighted. And my older sisters had just procured a rental of Terminator 2 on VHS. And so they were so excited to watch it at home, and they were making a really big deal out of it. Like, unplug the phone, because phones were plugged in back then, turn down the lights, and we're going to have this cinematic experience. And my cousin, who was visiting, was like, oh my god, I really want to watch that. And I was like, no, scary. Scary. I'm scared. It's going to be scary. <laughs> yep. But I didn't want to miss out. I had intense uh, childhood FOMO. And so I sat there and I watched it and I thought about it and thought about it for mm-hmm. weeks and weeks after the fact. And, you know, in addition to it being an incredible movie. And yes, before before you get the flurry of emails saying, that's not a horror movie, this Ugh. sci-fi yeah. action horror movie. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think yeah. even just realizing that it was nowhere near as scary as my imagination had suggested it might be. Yeah. Um, and that I enjoyed the experience of being thrilled and frightened, that that was really the gateway to uh, to more horror to come. And have you found that you've kind of gravitated towards different particular subgenres um, throughout your life, you know, and, and do you have a particular kind of favorite area of the genre or subgenre now? I don't. I feel like there are gems speckled throughout every subgenre. I feel like yeah, of course. On the flip side of that, there are tropes that really bother me, um, and uh, like stereotypes that bother me, and and techniques mm. that are uncreative and washed and used and recycled so often that they bother me. Um, <laughs> yeah. <it's, laughs> It's more like avoiding what I don't like. (laughs) Yeah, fair enough, fair enough. So let me ask you then, this series, we have been looking at home invasion as a subgenre. Really interesting subgenre, one that really divides people, I think particularly when people think about the traditional home invasion, whether it's, you know, martyrs or the strangers people have tend tend to have quite polarizing reactions to those we've kind of broadened out the subgenre a bit to explore stuff that is more on the periphery as well but what are your thoughts generally on home invasion andrea would you say you're a fan of of this particular subgenre i am a fan and i think there is there is way more to it than that i think i I think again that's that's almost uh it's almost like what i was saying before people just being like you know this is a trope that i find tired this is a torture porny thing that I find uninteresting and uncreative and that can permeate just any old type of movie. But uh, the Faculty of Horror did a home invasion episode where we talked about uh, one of the movies we're talking about today, but also The Strangers. And so, you know, we had the opportunity to really dive deep into what constitutes this idea of the home, what constitutes safety in the home. And when those uh, boundaries are blurred or indeed transgressed, how, how frightening and upsetting that can be. I don't think people necessarily are thinking of that as they're experiencing it, but I do think there's something to be said for just like you said, it, this one tends to get under people's skin. Yeah, I think it does, doesn't it? It seems to be the one that people are kind of set even horror fans even kind of like seasoned horror fans are like oh that's the stuff that i find the most triggering the most distressing why do you think that is is it because it's you know too close to home literally i think so i think so i mean for myself personally without uh without going a little dark on you i have experienced um a home invasion scenario uh, in a couple of different regards in my life. Uh, I've been burgled and uh, that was mostly upsetting to me on the level of they took my laptop and it was toward the end of the season and I had to yeah I had to write that email to my profs that we all dread having to write. (laughs) Thank God they were sympathetic. Um, And then I also did have an intruder in the night, um, a quasi an intruder with perhaps amorous intention who was too drunk oh to really and you know what mike i put him on the couch what you put him on the couch yeah 
I woke up with him standing at the foot of my bed. What? And I was like, you need to go on the couch, sir. You're not getting in my bed. And that I thought I was being a hard ass. Oh, oh my God. And it was only years and years later that I was like, that guy needs to be in jail. Holy and shit. I need to start checking my locks. Um, but that was but like, okay? He went on the couch and it was okay? He went on the couch and it was okay. Okay. Um, and, you know, I think I think if there was, if there was trauma inherent in that experience, I must have uh, repressed it. Because, again, I didn't realize how fucked up it was until until much later wow. but you know mike i've got friends i have friends female friends who live alone who cannot sleep until they go basement to attic and check all the locks and check all the closets yeah and if they think that maybe they haven't checked something and they got into bed they will get up and check that again mm -hmm. in spite of my experience i have never done that i am not like mm -hmm. that um, yeah, I don't know. How about you? Yeah, I think I've, I've been thinking a lot more about it <laughs> since I've been exploring these movies for most of the year. Um, because I think, you know, probably, and somebody said to me, well, this is probably because of my own privilege, really. But I think uh -huh. for me, it's never been anything that I've really thought about in a realistic way. But of course it could happen, right? It's It should be the thing that I fear more than anything else, because this is something that does happen. Like, like you, I know people that have been burgled, broken into, and there's no rhyme or reason for it you don't have to be a particular person or live in a particular type of house you know or have a certain job or a certain amount of money like it it does feel kind of random like it could just happen to any of us at any time so i think that that has hit home for me a little bit more uh, recently and i feel like there's a lot of home invasion movies out there that take pains to emphasize that it is random yes. that it is not targeted that it's you were in the wrong place at the wrong time and yes it, because you were home to quote the strangers and I, I think some people find that randomness comforting mm -hmm. that oh it's really unlikely to be me because it's totally random and other people are like <laughs> They find that alarming. It could be me because it's totally random. Yes. So, uh, so there's yes. a big spectrum of uh, of reaction to the, the, this theme in horror, which is fascinating. Totally. And I think what's been really fun as well is kind of like venturing outside of the, the, the traditional home invasion stuff like The Strangers and Funny Games and seeing kind of what is kind of... Home, inv home invasion adjacent almost right so like like the two movies we're going to talk about today yes the movies that can also include like i don't know i guess the kind of like social anxieties of being in someone else's home or somebody being in your space even in a kind of more mundane everyday way and how horror sort of filmmakers can find the fear in that stuff right because i think one of, I, we'll, we'll talk about this as we go but i think one of the things that really frightens me about both these films is that with these films i am actually like oh i would be that person that would exactly happen to me that is exactly how i would behave i wouldn't get the fuck out of there as quickly as i should be because i would be too polite and british about it or whatever you know and i think these are the kind of situations that really freak me out in a way you know i agree i think both these films i think it's a really inspired pairing by the way i'm uh, i'm really interested mm. in the aspects that these films share and also the ways in which they differ i think the most interesting aspect along the lines of what you're talking about is expectations and social conventions and I feel like there is an inherent there's an inherent awkwardness in every single social interaction I don't know what you're gonna say next I have a rough expectation of what you might say next but mm -hmm. if you say something that's totally contrary to my expectation I'm not gonna know how to react to that and yeah. it's gonna get weird so yeah. there is almost a social contract that we're gonna interact in a certain way we're going to take turns we're going to stay on topic we're going to this and that yeah those interactive rules apply to the household even more so mm -hmm. and um and and i think both these films really explore those tensions in really interesting ways are you a person that gets kind of like uh are you a person that experiences social anxiety in these sorts of situations like you know dinner parties and gatherings i mean again something that some of my guests have spoken about is that particularly since covid in the last few years like it has it has been a bit more daunting, that idea of kind of stepping into a space with lots of people, you know? You know, that's a great question because um, I was always a bit of an old soul. I was always a bit mature for my age. And so I really took to um, kind of classic etiquette. I kind of really took to rules of engagement with regard to, you know, having anecdotes prepared mm. and what to say and what to not say and that you have to bring a gift and you have to have the wine and you have to cheers and you have to this and this and that. I kind of got off on that at an early age. And, um, and, and I, I enjoyed that dance and the more elegant and elevated 
the uh, occasion was, the more that dance was elaborate yeah. and um, and I found that fun. However, I do find that in recent years, uh, post COVID um, social awkwardness, I. I still have those skills, but they just don't go down as easy. I find I fret Mm -hmm. post-interaction about was that okay? Was that appropriate? Um, People are are touchier about certain subjects than they were in the past. You know, like uh, growing up with a Republican dad or whatever, like a gun-loving uncle, um, (laughs) grandpa who's maybe a little racist. (laughs) You're accustomed to kind of dealing with those subjects and having a moving right along approach to them. But I think with the with the current state of politics, the current divisive nature mm. of politics, those those interactions are a lot more um, weighted and explosive than perhaps they once were. Yeah, yeah, completely agree with you. Um, and there's something about, I guess I'm different in that there is something to me about the formality of like a dinner party that does make me a little bit more on edge. Like I would not have a problem with going around a friend's, a friend sort of saying, come and hang out and have some beers and whatever, maybe we'll eat some food. But there's something about the presentation of a dinner party that actually kind of does make me feel a bit like, oh man, really? You know, like, and I, and I, and I have slowly started to discover maybe since the invitation, but like, a growing, uh, like, one of my favorite, like, niche, niche, niche sub sub genres is, like, the awkward dinner party horror, you know? Like, and there have been, it feels like there have been a kind of increase in those over the last decade or so, but they really get me. There is something about it. There's something about, like, setting something around that kind of, like, formal environment and then just letting that kind of tension bubble over, you know? Well, here's the thing, Mike, is I almost might be inclined to disagree with you there. Mm. A dinner party... You feel like you know what to expect. Well, that's true. You're going to show up. You're going to give the host their gift. You you might have a cocktail or something, maybe some hors d'oeuvres while you break the ice. You are going to eat a meal. You are going to have a dessert and you are going to say good night. And when that doesn't happen, there's hilarity to be had. I'm sure we're both thinking of the office episode. Yes, yes. (laughs) Classic. Absolute classic. At the very least, you expect to fucking eat. Yeah. Um... I almost find it more awkward when, when like, you get an invitation for something at le- that starts at, like, 7. Mm, mm-hmm. And you're like, is there going to be food? Do I eat? <laughs> what are the or rules? Do I not? Yeah. Who else is going to be there? What do I bring? Is it appropriate to bring this or this or that? At least the dinner party has these antiquated rules that, insofar as some of them might have evaporated, there is still that inherent structure. That's true. I find it really stressful to enter an environment when there's no context. Mm-hmm. Tell me what we're doing. That's so interesting, isn't it? Maybe I just like the chaos, but I prefer that. If, if somebody just says, come and hang... And maybe something will happen in terms of food. Maybe there are plans, maybe there aren't. I kind of relax more into that. I'm kind of like, fine, we'll all just go with the flow and make decisions as we go. Whereas there is something about the structured, rigid uh, kind of setup of a dinner party, the formality, the which cutlery do I use, the which wine should I drink, uh, or, you know, which uh, what kind of bottle should I bring, that puts me more on edge. And I think it's perfect for, for horror in that regard. Um, but anyway, maybe that's a good segue to, to kick off into our first movie. Let's begin by talking about the incredible The Invitation from 20. 2015. How this thing is so official. Maybe they're overcompensating. It's kind of hard to call everybody up out of the blue after two years. I'm so glad you're here. We've got a lot to talk about. So much to celebrate tonight. Each and every one of us is on a journey. And we feel that it's important to be on that journey with the people you love. Everybody, this is my friend Pruitt. Bars on windows and no. Security. Safer. You've been acting so suspicious of our hospitality. Well, Jesus. This is a film that concerns a couple on their way to a dinner party slash college friend reunion that is hosted by Eden. And Eden is Will's ex. And as if that wasn't awkward enough, 
The party is going down at the house Will used to share with Eden. And not only that, when they were a couple, they had a young son who died tragically. So this is, the recipe for awkwardness is great. But, mm -hmm. you know, it's also going to be old friends that uh, that Will seems eager to uh, reconnect with. And uh, a lot of love to be had in the room. And you feel that love when the dinner party starts. Unfortunately, you also feel the strain of a couple of weird strangers in the room who are really affecting the dynamic in a lot of strange ways. And it becomes apparent that Eden and her new partner, David, are both grieving and both sought to get help with that grief through a grief counseling group that is suspiciously culty. And they watch a recruitment video. They play a really weird parlor game. Everything gets weirder and weirder and weirder. Will feels weird, but he keeps attributing the weirdness to his continuing grief and discomfort at this situation. But lo and behold, he's right. It's a death cult. Oh, fuck. And then it becomes a race to get out of the mansion alive. Ugh. Beautifully done. Is that about Beautiful. right? Beautiful, yes. Thank you. Because um, there are quite a lot of little elements to that plot, actually, aren't they? Like, it, it, there it, are. There's a lot going on. And every time I watch this film, I pick up another one. Oh, my God. So what do you think of this film, Andrea? Tell me a bit about your history with it. Did you kind of see this movie when it first came out? I, I, it wasn't in the cinema. I think it was uh, It was already streaming somewhere. But uh, it, it was just kind of a word of mouth uh, sleeper that everybody was talking yeah. about the invitation and oh it's the same director as Jennifer's body and it's like well enough said I yes. will check it out and uh, and I did and it knocked my socks off right away and I kind of joined the the mm -hmm. choir of people recommending this online and um, and yeah I, I don't I wasn't quite so hard in the horror industry I wasn't quite so cemented uh, as I am now and so I, I don't recall that the invitation made quite as big a splash upon its release. Yeah. Uh, but I know it to be very highly regarded and, you know, uh, th there's been another invitation out since and so there's a lot of the 2015 one. Yeah, the 2015 yes. one. Watch yes, <laughs> yes, that's true because we've got two invitations now, haven't we? But yes, absolutely. Always go with the 2015 one. Oh my God, I love this film so much, Andrea. I saw it when it first came to streaming here and I've basically been talking about this movie nonstop for about seven years since this film came out. Like anyone who knows me knows how much I adore this movie. It's one of my favorite films of the last decade. I think it is genius. I really do. I think that Karen Kasama has done something truly astonishing with this film. It is, it's a slow burn character piece that is just brimming with dread. Um, Kasama has said that she was influenced by the slow reveal of movies like Let the Right One In, but also the unraveling traveling family reunion in movies like Feston and she wanted to make a film that that worked as a metaphor for what the nightmare of anxiety really is which is an irrational sense that people are trying to hurt you and that is what I get from this film in droves right this movie is like anxiety the movie it just bubbles with tension from the beginning you know I agree I think it's a brilliant script and it's a great story it's a simple story but whether that tension and dread, all of that lives and dies on the performances and the ability to portray awkwardness. Yes. Which is tricky because it's an intangible thing. Um, the scenarios are weird, but unless you feel weird about it with everyone else and that has to be communicated through music and gazes and it has to be communicated visually that's mm, tricky uh, mm -hmm. but it's pulled off beautifully here it is and it is like that's such a kind of like tightrope that it has to walk I think where it has to kind of feel real and believable that what these characters are doing that why are they staying in the house why are they continuing to do this and I don't know every, I, I buy it like I sort of buy every character's actions in this movie and how it progresses yes. to the point that it gets to you know um, which is like you said it, it, it made an incredible screenplay too I think like so so good yeah um, and also you mentioned this like it was a bit of a sleeper hit it's kind of word of mouth hit like I don't know why. Why is this movie kind of not lauded alongside the likes of, I don't know, Hereditary, The Babadook, some of the other movies that generally are considered some of the, the greatest horror movies of this last decade? Why isn't The Invitation included in that list? I mean, I think there's a couple of reasons. I, I think the examples that you just mentioned of Hereditary and The Babadook, they were very... Uh, fresh at the time that they came out. They, they, they were kind of the progenitors of, of, of new waves of horror and new movements of horror, whereas, yeah. whereas The Invitation kind of has very, very classic 
tropes, you know? It wasn't, uh, it did everything very well, but it didn't do anything especially new. And I think Mm. the other trouble it had is that, you know, uh, my synopsis was spoilery, there's a death cult. But throughout the film, you're never quite sure if it's going to go there. You're not sure yes. if it is or not. And so as such, it makes it kind of hard to be like, you should watch this film. Oh, what's it about? Yeah. There might be a death cult. <laughs> there might just be a dinner party. Who knows? Yeah. You know, when the it. whole thrust yeah. of the plot hinges on the twist, it mm. makes it a bit harder to sell. That's a really good point. And how do you find it on rewatch in that case? Like, do you find that it still works for you once you know where this is headed? Oh, absolutely. I think you're always Mm. right in there with Will. You are always... You're certain when he's certain and you're Mm. questioning when he's questioning, which I thought was so delicious because, you know, even when you know the ending is coming. And I feel like even when I first saw this film, I was like, this feels like it's going in death cult direction. (laughs) Yeah. It's still so tense that you're still invested. You're still, it could have gone either way and I would have been happy. Yeah, absolutely. There is this like... Uh, there's something almost as scary about knowing where it's headed, like this kind of inevitability, right? Of of the, like once that kind of train is on the tracks, it's just headed towards this this like this horrific ending. And you know whether you know that going in, whether you're seeing it for the first time, or whether you're watching it for the second or third time, I think you still. Well, I certainly still feel that that just impending doom that they're all headed towards. You know, it's so so good in that way. I feel like we've all been in those interactions where you're like, this is uncomfortable and I am not having a good time, I can just muscle through it. I'll just stay for another couple of hours. We're going to eat pretty (laughs) soon and then I can get the fuck out of here and me and my partner are going (laughs) to talk about how weird and fucked up this was all the way home. We've all been there. We've all duked it out. And so I think, you know, the tension within this film, you've got the one guest who leaves early and even that is extremely awkward. Even that people are like, oh no, don't go, let her go. No, 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 no. Because... It, it, it is disruptive. It is rupturing the social agreement of you are going to come and stay for dinner. And I, I feel like we are all aware of that pressure to sit and stay, even if you're not, just see it through. Yes. And so that's another reason why we're so deeply located within Will, that he knew this was going to be awkward from the beginning. Mm-hmm. Circumstances that don't even necessarily affect the rest of the guests. Yeah. But uh, you want to power through with them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and that moment when they get the cult video out, it's like, oh man, would you really stay? And then I think about it and I think, yeah, I'd probably, I'd be too polite. I would carry on. I would carry on with all of that bullshit. I would not only be- Telling me about the invitation. I would not only be too polite, but I'd be fascinated. I'd be like, yes, show me a video of someone dying. Um, (laughs) Because I'm weird like that. And, you know, sometimes, Uh. sometimes, sometimes- I like to say something a little bit inappropriate in a social situation just to see what happens. I'm a yeah. bit of a shit disturber when it comes to... <laughs> I'll, I'll find the boundaries of what yeah. I can do, talk about, and say. And, you know, just by virtue of being me, I'm always going to be the morbid weirdo in just about any social interaction. So I like to fuck with that a little bit. I love that. Um, so Karen Kasama, you've already mentioned there, director of Jennifer's Body, right? And she did these other kind of projects quite sort of varied in the stuff that she had done. But this was her first like true return to the genre, right? Since Jennifer's Body. Do, do, what, she's a, How would you describe her as a director? Like, do you see kind of similarities in any way between kind of the the kind of stylistic or thematic similarities or connections between what she did with Jennifer's body and what she does with The Invitation? I don't think so. Mm. I don't think I could see a given movie and be like, that's a Karin Kusama film. And I, I, I say that with the utmost respect because I think she takes, she picks amazing screenplays, first of all. Mm. She takes excellent stories and she knows what to do to get that story across as effectively as possible. And she doesn't use the same techniques to tell a different story, or she doesn't look for similar stories to use those same techniques. Like I think she's a filmmaker in every sense of the word in that it begins and ends with the story. And my job is to tell it. I kind of love that about, about, I think, Mm -hmm. I think, you know, the older I've got as well, that like, I, I have come to appreciate those sorts of filmmakers more in a way, the ones that don't always have to be like, I'm Wes Anderson, so I'm going to make everything look like a Wes Anderson movie or whatever. You know, these people that will completely kind of like do completely different styles and can pull off a range of different genres or subgenres or whatever and kind of 
perfect all of them in a way right as well and you're right like this is so wild i don't i don't think anyone would be able to look at the invitation and be like this is made by the person that made jennifer's body right but i think that's kind of amazing i think it's great and i think i I also hold her in such high esteem that when i do hear that something is directed by her i think i think the last thing i heard was I, i did you know that um that dead ringers tv show yes Yes. So I had put that on the cover of Rue Morgue and I had, um, had spoken to uh, the showrunner Alice Birch and Rachel Weiss and I think Karin Kusama only directed a couple of episodes yeah. but as soon as I heard that I was like this is going to be Absolutely. great. This is going to be solid. Absolutely. It's like a big stamp of approval isn't it? I think it's the, it is the reason why I started watching Yellow Jackets too because she had something to do with that. <sighs> she directed a couple of episodes or she was an executive producer or something and she's one of those names. Jordan Peele does this a lot now doesn't it? Doesn't he? But like he attaches like these these people that will attach their name to something and immediately I'm like I need to check that out. And Karen Kasama is definitely one of those people for sure. Agreed. Yeah. Um, let's talk about the backdrop here, the setting. The film begins, obviously, with our main couple driving towards this house and they're driving up the Hollywood Hills, right? We've got this backdrop of LA and Hollywood. Now, this is something we've talked about a lot this series. We've done everything from Whatever Happened to Baby Jane and Sunset Boulevard through to Nightcrawler a couple of weeks ago and, and Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Yes. These movies particularly that take place in the home and are about crime in the home that are set against the backdrop of LA and Hollywood. And I wonder how much of that is chalked down to the Manson family murders, of course, from the late 60s. Do you think that's played into this movie too, that kind of the backdrop there of of Hollywood and LA? Very much so, very much so. I think even upon the very first glimpse of Sadie, Mm. the very first glimpse that Will has with her, looking down the hall, she's wearing a shirt and nothing else. She's standing yep. there. She doesn't react to him staring at her. There is so much about that two-second held gaze that yes. communicates so much about Sadie and about this evening that something is wrong with this chick. Something is <laughs> wrong with this chick. And I think even the fact that, you know, she's standing there without panties. And then when she shows up as this free love, carefree hippie girl, it communicates Manson very, very early on. Yes. It communicates that uh, these people are living outside of social norms and conventions mm-hmm. in a way that they think makes them feel free, but is in fact deeply unsafe for everyone involved. I think it smacks of that. And yeah. even if you don't recognize it on a cognitive level, you recognize it on a thematic level in that it works and it works and it just works better and better throughout. Yes. Um, you know, when they get to the game, when they get to the whole I want, that uh, that air of hedonism, that air of individualism that I think is, um, is really personified by the city of L.A. I, when I think of L.A., I tend to think of... Uh, um, a, a designer trench coat full of cockroaches. You know what <laughs> Amazing, I mean? It is yes. the epitome of success and glamour, but it is also so deeply, deeply rotten. It is so corroded. It is so um, miserable. Mm-hmm. And when you have these successful professionals with a lot of influence, a lot of affluence, a lot of wealth and money, the lengths that they will go to to be yeah. comfortable... Because they're not yes. comfortable. I love that. Even with all these material goods. And so I feel like it works really beautifully in LA. It's so, yeah, that's such a good point. And I, I totally feel that too. I mean, it must be deliberate, right, that her name is Sadie too. Because I think one of the Manson girls was Sa- Sadie, right? Sexy Sadie. Uh, her real name was Susan Atkins, but she was known as Sexy Sadie. So I think there were like overt kind of references there. But yeah. I love that about, I think that's true about the LA kind of backdrop, isn't it? There, there's this fascinating fascinating trend in horror but all kinds of movies I suppose about LA in which it's like the kind of beautiful facade but the kind of darkness behind the curtain right like that does seem to be kind of what what so many movies set in LA or about LA are all about I'm going for the first time next year actually I've never been oh, in my whole life that's to LA. exciting I know I'm kind of I can't wait slash I'm very nervous because you know every film I've ever seen is like LA's a actually hell underneath you know but uh but lots of beautiful people on the surface so fine whatever oh it's great to visit the weather is amazing the food is amazing the shopping is amazing just don't just don't 
don't stay too long. <laughs> exactly that. <laughs> um, yeah, and the house as well. Like, th- this is another kind of interesting thing that we've been talking about a lot. Obviously, such an important element of all these movies set in the home is the home itself. Uh, what do you think of the way in which Karen Kasama kind of presents us this this home and the geography of the space and the way in which this kind of space is established that we spend pretty much the whole film in, right? Just within this house. Yeah, yeah. I think the home itself is significant on so, so, so many levels. Like, I think mm. you could almost even construe it as as a haunted home in that right. everywhere Will looks, he is witnessing ghosts of his past, deeply, deeply traumatic things that kind of pop up and inform his headspace, inform his relationship with Eden, mm. inform what's going on with her, inform aspects of the story, but they also just stain the house, which is so beautiful. Yes. It is like, you would think that you would love to live there, but at the same time, you're like, something's not quite right about that place. And it's because it's just dripping with that trauma. Yes exactly right and yeah a haunted house is kind of the perfect way to put it isn't it because the house is just it's dripping with bad memories and bad vibes I also think it's so interesting to note that in LA you know like it's a huge city it's a very densely populated city people are living in shoeboxes it's like New York Mm. it's like Toronto it's like any major metropolis in the world But it's also the kind of place where if you're rich enough, you can afford some isolation. You can afford to get up into the hills. And I think, you know, as we see with the gut punch of an ending with this film, that isolation and the isolation of affluence to the Hollywood Hills is what makes this whole invitation work. Mm, it absolutely does. You're so right about that. And the, the the discomfort that we feel, the dread that we feel, is really so much channeled through Logan Marshall Green, right? Like, we are so kind of aligned with him. There's a lot of the film that is just like, we are up in his face throughout like a lot of the movie right and it's almost like we're seeing things through his kind of distorted vision but but what do you think of this sort of this main character of will that we kind of are stuck with in this movie and and logan marshall green's performance you know i thought i thought he was just perfect because like i said you know I'm also, on the onset, I'm going to say that I'm not the type of person who gets mad at a character for not doing what I expect them to do. You're watching a movie, you need the story to play out. People are different. People do unexpected things. I did not feel that about Will. I felt like his actions were often very understandable, even though he's coming from a perspective that I could never possibly understand, which is, you know, the grief of a parent. That's like one of the most demolishing things that can happen to you at all. And I also appreciate that he's not... A caricature. He's not one-dimensional. And I think no. what really tripped me up on this rewatch, watching it to prepare for uh, for this conversation, Mike, was the whole intro of hitting that coyote. Right. Now, that is a very tropey thing in horror. Yes. And I always, every time I see it, I recognize it as a signal to the viewer that this is a person who is a survivor. This is a person who is a moral person. Mm. They are going to do the right thing, even if it is difficult, even if it is violent. Mm. And I think introducing us to that side of Will from the very onset, and then such a deeply emotional and sensitive side to Will later. And you notice that he doesn't mercy kill Sadie? Right. Yeah, that's a really good point. Yes, he just leaves her there. With, he steals her poker or whatever it is that she's sitting there with yeah i don't even know if i clocked that the first Mm. two three four times i watched this film but i clocked it at this last time and it's just is that to say that she is unworthy of the compassion is that to say i don't know but i love that i don't know because that's a good character he is brilliant i think and you're absolutely right you know he's he's considering we're so closely closely aligned with him throughout the whole movie he does everything that i sort of want him to do at each moment in the film and i know that he kind of he goes back on wanting to get the hell out of there once their friend Choi arrives but also i can kind of buy into that and you know like and i and i genuinely am kept guessing all the way through yes is he right in his suspicions or is he not you know and i think again like the the character of will and that performance it handles it beautifully yeah if he had been too certain if he had been too arrogant i I wouldn't have rolled with him because, you know, we've Mm. all been in awkward situations. Where am I right? Am I wrong? And then when you're Mm -hmm. wrong, you're humiliated and mortified. And that was a very um, emotional performance for him, him that I bought entirely. And it's these little things, isn't it? And this happens a lot with Speak No Evil too. It's these little things that 
could be sinister, but they also could just be every day. So, oh, okay, the guy locks the front door when they're all in the house. Oh, okay, they're, you know, they've got some pills in the bedroom. Like, all of these, like, little things are adding up in his head. But actually, they could all be completely mundane, everyday things, don't they, as well? And I think that is, again, where the not just the mystery, but that kind of dread and suspicion kind of starts to build again very cleverly with very kind of small micro kind of moments throughout this movie, you know? Oh, yeah. Microdosing terror. Microdosing terror, exactly. <laughs> and and that is it. That's, that's, that's this film in a nutshell, really, isn't it? And what do you think of these other... Because again, like, I, I think all of the characters are great. Some of them do less than others, but I, you, you get the feeling, right, with all of these performances and this script that... These are people that have a history, that they know each other, that they have di- certain dynamics between each other. They have, you know, certain relationships. And, you know, again, with relatively little, you really get that, don't you, I think? Well, that's right. That That's absolutely right. And I think, again, that's a testament to a very strong script that we have all these characters that we don't know that much about them. We only know them with reference to Will and in how they talk to Will about the time that has passed since they last saw each other. And, and that is a very... Mm pregnant time in Will's history. And I think, you know, to be able to hear friends saying, I wanted to reach out, I wasn't sure how, but I just don't want you to think that I wasn't thinking of you. That is so, so real. That is so deeply real. And I think, you know, it just speaks to uh, grief can be isolating. Mm. That when you need people the most and people know that you need them, but they don't know what to do. Again, that goes back to the whole overarching theme of expectations, how to behave, what to do and what to say. Yes, yes. And I think Eden is a brilliant character too, because like the, the, the actress, Tammy Blanchard, like there is something in her performance where she's like, she's very amicable and she's very friendly and she's smiley but there's something that's really kind of tightly wound within her right like you can feel this like I don't know almost like mania behind the eyes in that performance all the way through as well it's really powerful I think you know it's so powerful it is so Mm. tragic and that fragility because you want her to believe the bullshit she's spouting you almost want her to believe that she is okay and that she's gotten past all this pain but there's something in her face and you know it's not true it's so good, isn't it? It's all in the eyes. She just feels like she's just ready to spring. She's ready to burst at any point. And then, of course, you've got Pruitt, right? Played by brilliant character actor John Carroll Lynch. He pops up in so many films, usually playing somebody a bit sinister, right? And this is the case here. He's this kind of mystery guest that nobody knows. Why is he here? Why is he part of this dinner party? Why is he oversharing so much, telling people he's just met about how he killed his wife in what I think is one of the most sinister and disturbing scenes of the film right hearing how everyone reacts to it as well what do you think of uh, John Carroll Lynch here and, and Pruitt as a character oh I thought Pruitt was just brilliant I, again with the wrongness that this guy and Sadie but they come kind of from from different ends of wrongness right like uh Pruitt's oversharing about his history, Mm -hmm. while on the one hand sort of fascinating, is also deeply unsettling, because he is a stranger among them. He is clearly large. And he, every so often, he says something that has some sort of authority. He takes control of the situation through various really small, subtle cues, which again is, is, is a social interaction like, Whose house is this? Who's in charge? There are power dynamics in every social interaction, whether we're aware of them or not. And I feel like he he just casts this shadow over everything that, you know, look out for Pruitt. There's this like, the the, the tension just escalates and escalates where the, the members of the cult show everyone the video of somebody dying and John Carroll Lynch confesses to murdering his wife. And then they start doing kind of dares where they're kissing each other and stuff. And there's that moment where the one character who actually speaks out, I think it's Claire, right? Who says, I'm gonna leave, I'm uncomfortable here. They really, really try and attempt to keep her there, but eventually, Eventually, she does actually leave. Do you think she gets away safely, Andrea? Because we see her walk to her car and then we see Pruitt kind of chase her out into the street quickly. Did she get away safely? I don't think she gets away safely. I, I thought about this. I it, mm. it was kind of a red herring in that I expected her body to pop up. Yes. I expected that to kind of be the proof, like the, like the antithesis to the whole Choi finally mm-hmm. showing up thing. Um, but then it also occurred to me that why would they care if somebody got away, if they're all going to kill themselves anyway. Yeah. Um, 
And I think the fact that I'm inclined to question that, the fact that you even asked that question and they left it ambiguous mm. is just delicious scope for conversation post film. So good. Yeah. So good, isn't it? Um, yeah. So how do you find the, and actually, like, I haven't really asked you, but the first time you watched this, do you remember? Did you know? Did you did you assume that this was headed where it was headed? Or did you think there is a chance that th there could be nothing sinister in this? Because I guess you know if you're going in it in the context of watching a horror movie, right? But, but do you remember kind of what you first thought when you watched it? Do you know what, Mike? I am not the kind of person who tries to figure out a movie while they're watching it. Yeah. Are you? No, not really. And actually, I, I am always somebody that is surprised by twists because I never try and figure them out, which I quite like. <laughs> you have to suspend your disbelief. You have to go in yeah. for the ride. And I know people who do it like without trying to. Mm. Like, I think it's just the way their brain works when they're hearing a story is they like, where's this? Like, they just get ahead of themselves. I actively yes. resist that with all my heart and soul. Um, but to actually answer your question, I feel like... I don't recall. No. I don't recall. I think I went back and forth in the way that Will goes back and forth. And I think that's like testament yeah. to the control that Kasama has in telling us this story, right? Because I think I thought, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, this is where it's headed. Then there's that moment when the missing friend, Choi, arrives home and you're like, oh my God, maybe this was nothing after all, you know? And I think I believed that with Will for a moment before then the shit hits the fan. So I think I seem to remember kind of flitting back and forth. But then, but then I remember there was a moment probably where I thought, would this be really, really disappointing as a film if nothing is going on and they all just have a lovely dinner party and then leave? Like, surely that's not the movie, right? But you never know. <laughs> that's what I remember too, is not being yeah. disappointed that it went where I thought it was probably going to go. Yes. Uh, that is such a hit or miss thing. And uh, it really depends on the person. It depends on the film. Uh, like I'm thinking of House of the Devil. Right. Where it was kind of the same thing. I was like, this looks like it's going here. And it did. And I was like, oh. Yes. But the invitation, I wasn't disappointed. I was satisfied on every level. Yeah, and I think there was there was probably a part of me that thought maybe this is going to go somewhere violent and horrific, but because of Will's paranoia, you know, like Will being his own downfall almost, that he gets so paranoid that he actually becomes violent and this whole dinner party descends into violence because of his paranoia and dread. And I thought that all the way up until the moment when they stand and do a toast and after the dinner is finished, they drink the dessert wine and Will freaks out, tells everyone not to drink it, knocking the glasses out of people's hands and it just descends into chaos. To a better world. To peace. Cheers. 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 Don't drink it! Don't fucking touch it! Will! And it's so awkward because you think again, oh no, Will's got it wrong. You know, this is going to descend into absolute chaos. And then, all of a sudden, Sadie goes insane, starts beating on uh, Will, saying, you've ruined everything. There is a violent altercation that happens, and then Sadie accidentally ends up getting knocked unconscious, and you think, oh my god, this is it. Will has let his paranoia get the best of him, and now someone is dead. Oh Sadie. God, Will, what did you do? Don't move her. Sadie, somebody call 911. I'm on it. But then you get a kind of double reveal, right? As the camera pans around and we reveal that one of the dinner guests, Gina, who has drunk the dessert wine, is actually dead, foaming at the mouth. She has been poisoned. This was a death cult after all. And this is it. One of the members of the cult pulls out a gun, starts shooting, and we get this explosive final act, right, where we've got people being killed left, right, and centre. It's a bloodbath. Andrea, what do you think of this final act all the way up until that chilling final moment, right, where we discover it's maybe not just happening in this house? Uh, I, I feel like that is the perfect stinger to a film that is so contained where you see this chaos erupt in this house, in this area. And then when the chaos is resolved, you know, um, I, we've seen so many horror movies where the survivors are like wearing a weird tinfoil blanket sitting in the back of an ambulance and mm -hmm. sheesh, that sure was hairy. Mm -hmm. I think that would have been fine. I would have still liked the movie. Yeah. But the idea that the invitation was happening all over LA, oh. it just, 
it makes you feel sick. Yeah. With the realization of how many people are fucking hurting out there and how many people might go to such lengths um, yeah. to deal with their grief. Yeah. the what, that It's icky. What a gut punch that final shot is with just... It's so simple. It's so, it's so beautifully simple, isn't it? But just seeing several red lanterns just scattered across those hills and just you just hear sirens and screaming right and that's kind of it cinema it's oh. wordless it is the language of cinema that we connect the dots and we understand and we want to puke it is pure cinema you're absolutely right somebody tweeted me when i said i was watching this film and they said you know they said it's the sort of film where they've described it to their friends and people have kind of gone well that doesn't sound that impressive and it's almost like on paper this movie doesn't sound and like anything you have to experience it right because of that cinematic language that this movie is told through it's so so good that's right. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, usually I would ask people, you know, how does this movie hold up, you know, re-watching it now? It's not a massively old film, um, but do you find that you still enjoyed it just as much watching it this time around as you did the first time? Oh, yes, absolutely. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. You know, we, we were talking a little bit before about uh, about COVID and the, and the awkwardness of social interaction and catching up. I feel feel like if anything it's all the more relatable as we are having these um you know uh social interactions with people we love and haven't seen in a while and it's hard and why is it hard why should it be hard Mm. there's a lot of reasons why it's hard Mm -hmm. death cults my god there's even a there's even a lockdown like joke in this movie as well isn't it like as in like somebody says something like this is america we can lock (gasps) down if we want to lock down or something like wow there's something kind of chilling about watching that now you know crazy um all right well we're going to move on to the second movie in just a second but first of all let's head on over to this week's wild about horror because psychoanalyst and cinephile mary wilde has got a lot of thoughts on karen kusama's the invitation Hey Mike, Mary Wild here, with some thoughts on Karin Kusama's masterful horror film, The Invitation, about unsettling tensions and shocking events that occur when a man attends a dinner party hosted by his ex-wife. Kusama cited the film's theme as, quote, a metaphor for what the nightmare of anxiety really is, which is this irrational sense that people are trying to hurt you somehow, end quote. Will and his girlfriend Kira arrive at his ex-wife's Eden house in the Hollywood Hills. Will and Eden divorced after the accidental death of their young son Ty at their home. Eden met her new husband David at a grief support group in Mexico. Their friend Sadie is also at the dinner party. It is the first time their old friend group has been together in over two years. Throughout the evening, Will wanders through his former home and relives memories, including Eden's attempted suicide. David's friend Pruitt arrives. He is a large, physically imposing presence at the event. David locks the front door, citing a recent home invasion in the neighborhood. Will discovers Eden hiding a bottle of barbiturates. David and Eden tell their guests about their support group, which ostensibly helps people work through their grief. David shows everyone a video in which the group's leader, Dr. Joseph, comforts a dying woman as she takes her last breaths. Will senses a weird, unsafe atmosphere at the party, but he's told it's natural to feel strange about visiting the site of personal tragedy and that it's a brave thing to show up. David and Eden pour drinks for the guests to toast, but Will warns everyone not to ingest it and smashes the glasses, fearing they're poisoned. Sadie attacks Will, who inadvertently knocks her unconscious in the scuffle. Gina who had sipped her drink before Will's intervention, collapses and dies. 
David, Pruitt, and a recovered Sadie attack the guests, killing Miguel, Choi, and Ben. Will, Kira, and Tommy flee and hide in the house. Will overhears David tell Eden that they've been chosen and that finishing what they started is the only way they can leave the earth and be free of their pain. At the heart of this religious cult is the belief that life on earth is abject suffering, marked only by loss and sadness, and that the best we can hope for is the sweet release of death, at which point we'll finally be reunited with our deceased loved ones. This is a suicide cult, teaching its members to resist the life force and give in to the impulse of self-annihilation. On his drive to the dinner party, Will accidentally hit a coyote with his car. He then committed a mercy killing, putting the wounded animal out of its misery. This occurs in the opening scene of the film, setting the tone for what ensues, aligning with the morbid ideology of his ex-wife's cult. That the ritualistic murder of our fellow brothers and sisters is a humane thing to do, because life on earth irreparably injures our body and soul. To stand by and not put an end to sorrow is to be complicit in it. When Will enters Eden's house, she immediately notices blood on his face from the coyote. She wipes it away and says, You're a mess. This isn't just a literal statement. On a deeper level, she is commenting on her ex-husband's unhealed grief for their dead son. She believes she has risen above earthly suffering via her faith and views Will's sadness as a failing. The first time Sadie appears in the film is down the hallway. Will is the only one who notices her initially. She is naked from the waist down. My reading of Sadie is that she performs the erotic function of the cult, the seductive element that draws people in. Visions of the past flood Will's mind when he's back at the house. He experiences flashbacks. He seems numb and disengaged, showing a dulled response to his environment, all signs of psychological dissociation. When he's not zoning out, Will is hypervigilant, scanning situations, overly alert to potential danger or threat. We hear David telling Will, quote, You've been acting very suspicious of our hospitality, and frankly it upsets me a little. I lock the door so we can have some peace of mind and you have a fit about it. My friend needs to move a car and you stand at the window like you're going to catch him stealing something. You seem very distant, very off somehow. You must feel like you have to be on the lookout, that the world is unsafe, very chaotic. What happened before can always happen again. End quote. Sure enough, Will can't help but sense that something terribly bad and wrong is happening at the dinner party. He doesn't feel safe there. Flashbacks, dissociation, and hypervigilance are some of the main criteria for a diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder. PTSD develops after experiencing events such as sexual assault, warfare, natural disasters, traffic collisions, unexpected death of a loved one, life-threatening illness, child abuse, domestic violence, or other threats on a person's life or well-being. In addition to flashbacks, dissociation, and hypervigilance, PTSD symptoms may also include nightmares, attempts to avoid triggering cues, and an augmented fight-or-flight response. A person with PTSD is at a higher risk of suicide or intentional self-harm. My view is that the premise of the dinner party in the film, the cult's belief that it is merciful to end human suffering by murder-suicide, is an internal conflict that Will is struggling with, which is then staged and plays out externally in this group dynamic. 
Will doesn't understand how his ex-wife can appear so detached. Eden tells her guests, quote, Pain is optional. It's really pretty simple. All of the negative emotions, grief, anger, depression, it's all just chemical reactions. It's entirely physical and changeable. You can actually learn to expel those emotions from your body so you can live life the way you want to. End quote. The logic of what exactly is getting expelled is not disclosed. We come to understand that it is the will to live that is erased by this faith based organization. The cult equates earthly life itself with the malaise of depression. Their leader tells them that the only way to stop hurting is to die. They can leave all this pain behind and move on in the afterlife. David's testimony is said to lend support to this idea. He says, quote, I was a slave to my own grief. Dr. Joseph freed me from that. End quote. The cult minimizes the death taboo by encouraging the practice of passing away in a friendly group ceremony. So-called communion is elevated as a virtue. What I find most fascinating in relation to Will's experience is the character of Pruitt. He tells the group about his wife Margaret, a talented and charismatic artist described as being all light. Pruitt and Margaret had been married for eight years when one night, after he'd been drinking, they argued over a minor problem and something just gave inside him. He turned and hit her as hard as he could. Her knees buckled, she hit her head and just collapsed. Margaret died on the spot. Pruitt says that it was a terrible mistake that occurred seven years ago and that he paid by spending time in prison. But he was still the same person. It was only by joining the cult and looking only ahead, destroying that horrible part of himself that made the killing possible, that he was finally cured. He says that he misses his wife and thinks of her every day, but he no longer grieves or feels guilty. He has chosen to let go of those useless emotions because he knows that he'll be seeing her again soon in a better place than this. That's what this cult believes, and he can't wait to get there. Pruitt says, quote, Forgiveness doesn't have to wait. I'm free to forgive myself, and so are you. It's a beautiful thing. End quote. Will becomes visibly upset hearing this story. He feels that it's relatable because he blames himself for the accident that took his son Ty's life. He later tells his girlfriend Kira, quote, I'm not okay. My son is dead. Where do I put that? It's like a scream trapped inside me, and nothing changes the fact that I should have been watching more closely that day. It was another kid, and Ty loved him, and they were just playing. They were just messing around. I shouldn't have let them have the bat. I've been waiting to die since the moment it happened, end quote. When the violence breaks out toward the end of the film, Pruitt urges Will to let go. He says, quote, There's a plan for us. We'll be there soon, I promise, end quote. This is a manifestation of the guilt Will carries for Ty's death a guilt that leads him to the daunting mindset of suicidal ideation and wishing simply to disappear. This is what he's really fighting against. Pruitt is an external representation of the way Will perceives himself as a ruthless convicted killer. Later in the film, when Sadie physically attacks Will, he lashes out at her in self-defense, she loses her balance, her head slams on the sharp edge of furniture, and she falls to the ground. This plays out very similarly to what occurred between Pruitt and Margaret, further linking Will in his mind with Eden's thuggish ex-con friend. Prior to this, Sadie had come on to Will, a sexual advance he rebuffed. She said, quote, You can fuck me right here. Why should we deny that ever? 
That's the way we were in Mexico. Everyone was just going for it. It was awesome. I can make you like me so much. I can make you beg me. I can do it without touching you. Just with my voice, with my breath. You can hurt me if you want. End quote. Even in this failed seduction attempt, the implication is that Will might be excited by hurting another person, which I believe is tied to Will's guilty conscience where violence is avidly repressed, but nevertheless acts as a driving force. It's worth spending some time on one of the most effective scenes in Kusama's film, where the guests move up the stairs to the dining room where a beautifully set table awaits. We watch from above and faintly overhear the conversations in the warm pool of light of the dinner table. A droning sound insistent begins. We wash in and out of conversations. Food is passed back and forth. There is laughter. We close in on Will's face. He's having a hard time unable to connect with those around him. We are deeply in his point of view. Conversations sound fake, seams and gaps revealed. There's something primal about the way people are tearing at their meat, something grotesque about all of it. Echoes of a child's cries coalesce on Gina's face, her mouth open mid-laughter. It's like she's screaming. Will looks wearily at the way Pruitt consumes the meat on his plate. Red wine pours into a glass. Some of it splashes out on the tablecloth. It looks like bloodstains. Eden smiles through her tears. The droning sound grows louder. Everyone appears slower and faster all at once. Kira's expression is frozen. She looks away. Her features blur out. Will calls out to her in vain. He panics. We are caught in Will's flashback. He is no longer at the dinner table. He's locked in the past. It's daytime at a child's birthday party. Adults are talking. Ty, his son, and another boy are playing, roughhousing. The children hold baseball bats. The rays of the sun splinter the sky. Will runs, pushing through people. Eden is on her knees in front of them. She screams. This scene carefully illustrates the build-up to a flashback, the way that a moment in time is spliced, the past violently invading the present, hijacking consciousness, as if the trauma is being relived all over again. The scene shows how alienating PTSD is via the jagged edges of intrusive thoughts, how disconnected the sufferer feels from their surroundings. As terrifying as much of Kusama's film is, I believe that an essential psychological issue is being resolved and sorted out that the torment is not for nothing. For too long, Will was an avoidance autopilot, but being back at the house forces him to confront a range of painful emotions, sadness, anger, and guilt. He can no longer pretend that everything is okay and sharply demands to know, quote, why is everyone being so fucking polite? This isn't right. Something very strange is going on and no one is saying anything. We don't see you for two years, Edie, and then suddenly you invite us to this lavish dinner, all smiles, spewing all of this jargon. Don't tell me this is normal. The invitation? It's a cult. Look at the video. It isn't about communion or family. It's about denial. It's a fucking brainwash. Our son died and you're ignoring it. It meant something when he died. You're trying to erase him. Ty was real. It was real. It is real. Tell me why the doors are locked. Tell me why there are bars on the windows. Tell me why there is a big fucking bottle of barbiturates stashed in your bedroom. Something is going on here. 
something dangerous, and we're all just ignoring it because David brought out some good wine. End quote. This powerful moment punches through the artifice of civilization. Will refuses to play along and radically expresses his grief, even if it's perceived as bothersome and antithetical to the party's atmosphere, even if he's seen as behaving unreasonably. Will insists on bearing the agony of bereavement. He doesn't try to cover it up for the sake of social facade and pleasantries. By speaking up, he honors Ty's life and acknowledges his son's memory. Eden's locked doors, barred windows, and sleeping pills are repression tactics, attempts to block out the horror of losing a child. I think that the final scene in which Eden shoots herself in the abdomen is an allegorical admission designating at long last the place where it hurts. For these parents, the film is a mechanism of shedding defenses and finding emotional liberation through reprocessing. Until next time. A big thank you to the brilliant Mary Wilde. And don't forget, if you want to hear more of Mary's takes on cinema and other things, you can sign up to her Patreon, patreon.com forward slash Mary Wild. Hello, everyone. Just before we get into the second half of this week's episode, I want to take a moment to thank this week's sponsors. That's Emily and Ruth from the Nottingham Horror Collective Zine. They sent me a message to say, Hey, Mike, huge fans and newly subscribed $20 Patreon here. Love, love, love the pod. A bit about us. We create beautiful, illustrative zines dedicated to celebrating and exploring the horror genre. Each issue follows a tarot card theme, e.g. the High Priestess is our celebration of women in horror, the devil focuses on demonic horror, etc. They include original artwork, articles, film criticism and short stories by horror-loving creatives from all over the world. Our eighth issue is coming this October, which is themed on the tarot card Justice, an exploration of revenge horror. Uh, It would mean the world to us if you could check us out or give us a follow on Instagram. Uh, Thank you so much, Emily and Ruth. That's sounds awesome what a cool idea as well to base each issue on a different tarot card as a as a different theme i love that idea so if you want to check out this awesome zine which is filled with original artwork and articles and film criticism short stories and a whole bunch of other great stuff head to their website the nottingham horror collective.co.uk or follow them on instagram at the Nottingham Horror Collective. One more time, a huge thank you to this week's sponsors. That's Emily and Ruth from the Nottingham Horror Collective zine. Uh, And if you want to become an official Evolution of Horror sponsor, get your own little dedicated segment on an episode just like this, then you simply need to sign up to our Patreon at the top level of $20 per month. That's about 17 English pounds per month. Uh, Head on over to patreon.com slash evolution of horror. That top tier level will give you access to absolutely every piece of bonus content. I think there are now over 200 episodes in the Patreon vault to listen to, and it will also give you your own little dedicated segment on an episode of the main feed as a sponsor just like Emily and Ruth here where you can plug your own work your blog your podcast your music your artwork anything you like or just write me a message that you would like read out anything you like if you're a $20 patron just stick it in a message to me and I will get it read out that's patreon.com slash evolution of horror Okay, let's return to the second half of this week's episode in which Andrea Subasati and I discuss my favourite horror movie of 2022, Speak No Evil. Dear Louisa, Björn and Agnes, how are you? We were just talking the other day how nice it was spending time with you this summer. We would love to invite you to come to visit us. Yeah, you made it! <laughs> Sorry for the mess. It's gonna get much worse. Come on. <laughs> He's been cooking all day. He's making wild boar. This is for you. I'm a vegetarian. I insist. <laughs> I insist. 
Bare tage en lille plads. Nej. Hej, Abel. Abel has some difficulty speaking. He has what you call congenital aglossia. Meaning basically, he's born without a tongue. Abel, I've got this. He's only a child, for Christ's sake. You can't talk to him that way. What is wrong with you? Oh my god, Speak No Evil from 2022, Andrea. Just when I thought a movie couldn't possibly give me more anxiety than The Invitation, here we are. Andrea, set the scene for us. Give us a little plot synopsis for this one. Okay, okay. This one's not quite so simple, and I also feel like this is going to be another film that on paper it's like, huh? Yeah. You have to experience it. <laughs> yes. I'm going to spoil the shit out of it, so guys, if you haven't seen it, oh my pause. god, go watch it right now. Right now! Run! Bjorn and Louise meet Patrick and Karen on a holiday in Italy. And then when they're back home in Denmark, Bjorn receives an invitation to go visit this couple at their remote home in the Netherlands. And they decide to go. And it's a long drive. They take their daughter with them. And uh, as soon as they arrive, things start to get weird. They are guests in this home. Their conventions are a little different, but they're also strangely, Patrick and Karen are also strangely passive aggressive. They they kind of intentionally forget about Louise's vegetarianism. Uh, their son, who just wasn't on vacation with them in Italy, I believe, um, <laughs> yeah. has some kind of congenital disease where he has no tongue and is unable to speak and something kind of fishy about that. They have a really awkward night out where there's a baby's All these awkward little tiny things that I could list for you, but you have to experience them to believe them. Anyway, Bjorn and Louise at one point almost leave. They almost steal off in the middle of the night without saying goodbye, but then they think twice about it and return. Things are okay for a bit. Then they get weird again, and lo and behold, oh, shit. <laughs> Abel is dead, and there's a room in the back full of luggages and touristy things, and Bjorn is like, we got to get the fuck out of here. But they don't make it very far, alas. Um, uh, Agnes is kidnapped, and her tongue is removed, and Bjorn and Louise are forced to strip and then get into a ditch where they are stoned to death, guys. This movie does not fuck around. Stoned to death. It does not fuck around. This movie absolutely destroyed me, Andrea. And I'm so excited to hear what you thought about it because I've been waxing on about it since last year. It was my favourite movie of 2022. Uh, and I believe you had not seen it, right, before we recorded this podcast. So I'm so intrigued to know what you made of it. I loved it yes mike you know as much fun as i'm having recording this podcast with you you are going to wear the crown of the guy who tipped me off and made me watch this movie and that I'm is so crazy. glad mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that's a bigger deal than the rondo behind you oh my god I, honestly it is like this is because because again you talked about invitation as a word of mouth movie yeah it's always so satisfying when you show somebody the invitation for the first time right but i'm mm -hmm. i'm having this joy with speak no evil too because I can't believe how fucked up this movie is. Like, I, I think not since maybe when I watched Martyrs for the first time have I felt so, like, I don't know, wrung out from a film. Like, I, yeah. I physically had to kind of, like, walk away from my living room and go outside and walk around in the fresh air having finished watching Speak No Evil grass. for the first time. Yeah, honestly, like, I was not expecting it to go to the places that it went to at the end. Like you said, it doesn't fuck around, does it? Unbelievable. And, and this one, I don't even have the benefit of being like, oh, I wasn't the editor of Rue Morgue in 2015 when the invitation came out, so it went under my radar. I have no excuse for this. <laughs> I should have known about this. I should have put it on the cover of the issue. That is Mia culpa and my back. Now you're a busy person and there's a lot of films, right? There's a lot of stuff Better out late there. than never. Better late than never. And again, like The Invitation, I, I don't know if we mentioned this actually, but with both films, they didn't really get theatrical releases, right? They did just kind of like, I think they went sort of straight to streaming or at least they both did here in the UK. So, you know, there's another thing i think it's just like it didn't reach as many people necessarily or people just didn't hear about it as much of course and, and you know like say what you will about streaming uh obviously there are strikes happening and, and reform in the in 
industry definitely needs to happen. But th these movies are great examples of why I'm so grateful for streaming. Um, you know, those movies that you wouldn't have stumbled upon unless it was convenient. Those movies that did benefit from word of mouth because people had access to them. So yes, exactly that, exactly that. Um, so yeah, where to even start with this oh movie? God. I mean, again, like. How well does this movie, how effective do you find, I guess the kind of the similarities in what The Invitation does here in that it feels like it's a movie, a horror movie about social awkwardness, right? About, you know, what it means to go and stay at someone else's house who maybe has slightly different customs or whatever to yours, right? And I again, like, how do you find the way in which that is dealt with? Because again, like, like The Invitation, right? There's no actual horror until very late on in the movie. That's right. That's right. There's just mm. weirdness. There's just microaggressions and awkwardness, oh. which again are so unsettling. It's it's not horrific, but it does make you deeply uncomfortable. And and once you have that feeling of I don't know what's going to happen next. It makes you feel deeply unsafe, which is exactly where you want to be for the horror to finally hit. You just keep people mm -hmm. feeling off kilter for long enough. And then when the horror hits, you're almost grateful for it. You're almost like, put me out of my misery. This horrible, horrible yes. awkwardness I'm feeling. Uh, I feel like straight out the gates, I was able to relate to so much of this film, you know, mm -hmm. um, I think it's it's you have to be a little bit older in life before you can really understand this house guest scenario. Yes. You know what I mean? And it, like especially if you've ever made friends on holiday, it's a it can be a very fast friendship. It can be very intimate friendship. You're really seeing these other people at their best, at their most relaxed, mm -hmm. like out of their environment, enjoying life and um you can become very fast friends. You can feel like you know someone well very quickly but you probably also know that you don't truly know someone until you travel with them or until you live with them right that's very very true that changes everything yeah you're absolutely right as well about like that coming a little bit with age i think i'm now at a place i'm married and we i have noticed over the last few years that any new friends we tend to have made have also been couples like it's almost like it's become a thing now where when you make friends you know, at a at a wedding or at a holiday or whatever, it's very rarely just another individual. It's usually like, oh, we found another couple that we can hang out with, right, as well, which is like a very strange thing, I feel like, that comes when you get a bit older or when you're partnered or whatever as well. But I think, again, it, like even the setup of this movie where, you know, we meet them on holiday... All of that kind of feels very real to me, you know, like, oh, there's another couple that seem kind of cool on this holiday. Should we hang out with them? You know, how far do we push this friendship and all that kind of thing? That's true. And I think it's worth mentioning that the older you get, the harder it is to make friends yeah. just because you don't come across new people all that much. You've got your job, you've got your existing friends, you're busy. It's kind of hard to reach out of that social circle. And it like... you. To elaborate even further on what you were saying about like couples meeting other couples, oh great, we can all hang out together. The yeah. fact that there's also children involved, uh, we can go visit and the kids can play and the adults can have their thing, like that is kind of the ideal setup and I think that's part yeah. of what really seduced Bjorn and Louise into this whole equation. Yeah, I mean, what do you think is the reason that Bjorn specifically was so seduced in a way by this other guy? Like, they're really fascinating kind of I don't know, choices in that first act of the movie where he's kind of making eye contact with this other guy. He's lying awake at night thinking about it. He gets that letter from them. He, he won't let it go. He's desperate to go and visit them. The wife is a little bit more like, oh, well, should we? It's probably a bit weird. He is like dead set on befriending this guy, isn't he? What do you think that is all about? That kind of like, that kind of want to befriend these two? You know, I think that's something that um, that has always existed, but that like the public consciousness is is just starting to really recognize and understand is the bromance. Right. And, uh, you know, the, just kind of the idea that when you see someone who has the traits that you want, who represents the ideals that you want, and, and, and like coupled with kind of the ideology we have right now of, you know, you are the sum of the 10 people you hang out with the mm. most. Like you want to spend your time uh, improving yourself and surrounding yourself with people who are going to challenge you. And, and so when you meet someone who embodies all those qualities that you desire, it's 
tantalizing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You want them to like you. You want to impress them. You want to be part of their orbit. Because I guess he just, Patrick has a kind of, I don't know, how's the best way to put it? It's not like alpha, but he's he's more like, he's more confident, isn't he? And he's more kind of out there. He's, he puts himself out there more than Bjorn. And there's something, I suppose, that Bjorn kind of admires or aspires to in him or something that you get the feeling at the beginning. Although I actually didn't know at the very, very beginning whether or not there was an actual attraction. I was like, oh, is there something actually like, you know, that he's actually maybe attracted to Patrick in some way. But I think it's more, you're right, that he's like... He's aspiring almost to be this guy or something. Yeah, I think I think he was able to initially woo um, Louise when Louise said that she was vegetarian. I, I think he mm. just kind of automatically was like, "Oh yeah, well I'm a doctor of, with Doctors Without Borders, so I am also very you know." Insofar as he challenges her a little bit about the meat eating, no, he doesn't. He challenges her later. Scrap that. Yeah. Uh, he's very supportive of her decision. He flatters her about it, and then later he flatters Bjorn about, "Oh, you went back to get that." Bunny, that was very brave. Yes. Which is ridiculous. It's not very fucking brave. <laughs> I but know. But poor Bjorn, that's what he needs to hear. His fragile, fragile manhood needed to be stroked in that way. And he was like, oh, you know what? You know what, Patrick? I like you. Yeah, I like you. Exactly that. I think Bjorn is in a place in his life, right, where he's he's in the he's in the nine to five, day to day, the life of being a dad, of being a husband, of having a steady job. And it, it 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 borders on being that kind of a movie like, I don't know, American Beauty or something. The kind of classic man goes through midlife crisis and wants something better for himself movie, doesn't it, I think? There are hints of that, I think, at the beginning because, you know, you see his kind of obsession with making new exciting friends there when they're on holiday. Later on, he has that moment when he breaks down and cries and he, he ends up screaming into the wilderness, right? Kind of screaming with rage and frustration and whatever else i don't know how do you read bjorn as a character and kind of what he's going through in this film you know i've thought a lot about that because i loathe movies like falling down or joker yeah yeah where like cis white dudes are like oh i just can't take it anymore it's so hard to be me and i'm just no stop I didn't yeah. feel that kind of toxicity off of Bjorn. I didn't feel like he was insecure or weak or in 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 need of some alpha um, Joe Roganing in any way. I almost felt like mm. Bjorn was our conduit into a very very general state of adulthood can be very stifling. Social norms and conventions can be very stifling. Um, you know, he kind of. He has, like, a technophobic remark about, like, I find the GPS very stifling. Yes. I just want to drive and not be told where I want to drive. I, I, I feel like I connected with those elements on a very basic human level, mm. um, kind of outside of gender, if that makes sense. Yeah, you're right. And, and it's not just your classic, like... He's sick of his wife and kid. Like, actually, he, he and Louise seem to have a pretty healthy, sweet relationship, I think, for the most part, right? That's right. Yeah. She doesn't nag him. No. She doesn't uh, emasculate him. And I think I think it could have just as easily been her, but if it had been her, this is cinema, and we would have just talked about motherhood all the ding-dong that's day. True. So that's why I think it landed on Beyond. Yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> Interesting, actually, that both these movies... Put the men really at the front and center, which is often quite unusual for horror films, right? But I think it's it's interesting that they're both very much about these men and what they these fathers and what happens to their children too. But you know there are a lot of connections there, I think, which is interesting. Oh, well, unfortunately, we believe men, and men talking about their emotions are kind of like whoa, he's experiencing yeah. emotions. <laughs> this <laughs> is a so big true. deal. Stop the press. Yes, absolutely, um, Patrick. <laughs> Patrick and Karen then, this other couple, what do you make of them? Because again, like you said, they seem so charming at the beginning, right? And then it's these weird microaggressions that start to seep in throughout the movie. It's just like the invitation where it's these little gaslighty mm. things where it's like, oh. well, you did this. Well, well, I can explain that away. You're being irrational. And it is so hard to argue about something being inappropriate or rude or off-putting yes. because there's no rule book, you know, like maybe back in the Victorian no. era of etiquette, it's like you violated rules three, five, and seven and good day to you, sir. I take my leave. 
it's not like that anymore. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we all have our own boundaries with regard to what makes us comfortable. We all have our own breaking point, as we see in this film, which is, you know, frustrating but delicious and perhaps we can come back to that a little bit later but there's no right or wrong way to act and um ultimately it boils down to this is okay or this is not okay and then you have the awkward gauntlet of recusing yourself from the situation it's so good it's so well observed i think all that stuff because you what's brilliant is that you totally feel you know, you totally feel that this other couple are being unreasonable and a bit weird and creepy. Um, but when they kind of lay it all out, suddenly Bjorn and Louise sound ridiculous when they're like, we just want to leave. And they're like, why? And they're like, well, you were really touchy-feely at the restaurant and I didn't like the way that you had your music too loud. And like, and it's like, oh no, actually, when you say it out loud, it sounds ridiculous, right? And it is like, and it's it makes them sound very judgy. And, you know, they say, oh, the bed's too small and all these things that they're trying to come up with when we all know there is something very wrong in that house and they do all need to get the fuck out. But no one can quite like no one can quite define what it is and I think again that's just so clever in the filmmaking I think isn't it I agree and I think even beyond that at one point Karen kind of flips the script of like yeah we were in bed naked with your daughter but where were you where were you Louise that was like oh Oh, ah." god the, the the social etiquette around the children too, like, can another woman tell off someone else's kid or tell them to lay the tape? Like, you know, when, when suddenly Karen starts becoming quite motherly towards Agnes and it's all like, oh, it's so kind of excruciatingly cringe. But it's, again, it's like really well observed, that kind of stuff, isn't again, it? Again, there are no rules. It's something that no. you deal with on a case by case basis. But I think we've all been there when a friend's child is misbehaving and you want to backhand them and you can't. Can't. Yes, yes, exactly, exactly. But then also the way they treat their own kid, it's like, calm the fuck down, you know, like when when uh, when the little girl, when Agnes wants to go down the slide, but the boy won't move, and then they just kind of go ballistic. Dancing. At him. Yeah, oh, the dancing. The that dancing. is, that's the breaking point, isn't it? That's like, oh God, for the love of God. Well, it's Patrick's breaking yeah. point. That's when they're like, we have had enough of Abel, thank you. You can't dance, yeah. get in the pool. Oh, it is. Oh, Jesus, poor Abel as well. It's just like, did you see that? Did you see, again, probably not because you've just told me you don't really think about this, but like, did you have any idea where that was headed in terms of like, oh, this is a little boy that they stole from another couple and actually they've done this over and over again to like hundreds of children? No. And not only (laughs) that, I didn't even quite get there when Bjorn did. Right. Yeah. Well, it's very, it's Um, so creepy, that like wall of photos. The suitcases and the photos and the... I was just kind of like, wait, was that? Was that? And then he's off and running. And so, oh. like, I was almost a little behind. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> but no, definitely did not see that coming. And again, like, it's simple. Yeah. It's not complicated. It's not uh, manipulative. Um, but y- y- still seeing it happen, even if you suspected it, the way it's portrayed is so brutal. <laughs> Capital B brutal. And then, of course, we got to talk about that line. Oh, what the, why are you doing this? Because you let me, right? Holy oh. mick fuck. <laughs> so listen, like, Faculty of Horror, we talked about the strangers and we talked at length about why are you doing this? Because you were home. Yeah. Boy, that's scary. That's the scariest line in horror. That line, that line. This line <laughs> puts that to shame. And yeah. it is so perfect for yeah. this film, because you let me, yeah. because you let me trample you and effectively destroy your entire family out of social norms and etiquette, yes. because you were too polite to get your ass out of a situation that you were uncomfortable in. Wowie. It is. Wow. Yeah, exactly that. And it's 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 the it's a horror film of manners it's a horror film of etiquette right and it's and it's like you said what a perfect 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 summation of that in that line because you let him because you let me and he did he like and and also it goes back to this idea like you said the strangers there's there's so much of that that i've noticed re-watching all these movies funny games why are you doing this and they say why not there's like 
Low, like these, this kind of nihilism that goes hand in hand with home invasion, right? You know, home invasion yes. movies, they never, they never end well, sadly. At least with The Invitation, you kind of get why they're doing what they're doing, you know? They, <laughs> these are people yeah. going through something. I had an agenda and you got in my way. Mm-hmm. Um, but the culpability of bef- because you let me, I, I, and I feel like that was kind of, it resonated in their resigned attitudes when you're watching them strip, when you watch them just go into that ditch, you know, fairly certain that they're about to be murdered and not caring Mm -hmm. because they were past the point, just resigned to it. We let all this happen. Our child is gone and it's over. And holy shit, stoning to death? Like what kind of medieval fucking, it works. It makes perfect sense because, you know, to me, Patrick and Karen seem like the type of, like they don't want to make a mess. Yeah. They don't want to get their hands dirty. Yeah. They're not interested in mercy or compassion or making this over quickly. They're interested in being efficient, maybe getting some kicks in. Blah. Yeah, it is. Loved it. It's, it is. There's something, like you say, medieval about the whole thing. The the cutting oh. off of the... T- Again, I couldn't believe it, the moment when we actually just see them grab that little girl and cut off her tongue with a pair of sort of slightly blunt scissors. I'm like, what? I can't... Like, that was the moment when my hands were on my head and I was like, what am I watching? You know, it really went there. It's insane. You thought it might go there, and then when it did, it was still more brutal than you could imagine. And I also did pick up on... They made it a real point to point (laughs) out that these scissors are just so dull. Yes, yes. It's like they're... This is like being as nasty as possible. I love it. Um, And I I want to rewind quickly as well and just ask you a little bit about the house. You know, we talked about this big, beautiful, affluent, almost haunted house of the invitation... It, obviously, this is a very different environment. We've got this kind of smaller rural area in Holland. And what do you make of kind of the, the way in which the space itself, the house, is kind of portrayed in this movie? Uh, I, I don't have the the immediate socioeconomic association that I do with LA. Uh, I just don't know the Netherlands that well. Like it, 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 no. it seemed to me appropriate and on par with uh, with what a doctor. <laughs> might yeah. make and uh yeah um uh, i i think there was definitely a shade of her when uh when they when they mentioned that agnes would be sleeping in this room on this like pad on the floor that you don't yes. have a guest room yeah. you don't have something like that was kind of the first uh huh? this is a little bit weird um but yeah, like it, the house required distance from Bjorn. It required uh, isolation, and it met all those things. Um, mm, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. I, I think that's what I it is, isn't it? It's, it it's, no, I think you're right, and I think there is there's that distinction, isn't there? They at the beginning, you know, we get a very quick glimpse of it, but you do see Bjorn's flat, Bjorn and Louise's apartment, and it is very kind of. It looks quite beautiful and and well decorated, and you know these look like two professionals living in the city kind of thing. And everything in this house is a, a little bit more rustic, a little bit more shabby, right? They've got that that pool that is kind of like an inflatable swimming pool, and 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 everything is a little bit more old school as well. And I think again, it's like that's what Bjorn was kind of craving mm. almost, wasn't it? I think, like you said, the kind of get, getting away from kind of modernity almost. Yes. This like back to basics with Uh it and also i just love that it is it does feel smaller like the way in which you know there's all these moments when like when louise is in the shower and then patrick will come in and brush his teeth while she's in the shower and and you know there's a lot of like people like in each other's personal spaces in this movie as well like them children sharing the beds with people and like them seeing on the cracks under the doors people walk past and like i don't know you feel like everything is very on top of them in this house compared to like the big sort of labyrinthine house of the invitation, I suppose, in a way. Yes, that makes a lot of sense that they're kind of right on top of each other and like the invasiveness of being in each other's living space on top of each other all the time. Yeah, yeah, I think it it just adds to that feeling. Because actually, did one of them say that? Or I can't remember, but I think they talk about feeling claustrophobic um, in that house as well. Like I think it is like... 
you know, like, or oh, maybe it's it's when it's when Bjorn has his little meltdown and he talks about how he feels claustrophobic, right? But I, I think it, it, there is that kind of emphasis on that that there's this like oppressive space that they're all trapped in together, I suppose, in this sure. in this house. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, but then also that vast space outside as well. So it is a kind of really interesting thing. Um, did you find that you believed it too? Because the, the 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 negative that I've heard from people, and I think at the, at the issue that a lot of people have with it is, why did you go back? For example, you know they get mm-hmm. away in the night, they go back to get the bunny. You know, like does he make one too many stupid moves for you? The the um, Bjorn like throughout this movie, or did you kind of were you happy to kind of go along with it? I- I struggled with the initial return simply because <laughs> what would you say? Right. We tried to slip back. Like, no. If you're going to make a clean break, which first of all, I don't even think I would have done that in the first place. I think I would have made an excuse. Mm. Made up an excuse. We just heard from the caretaker and the house is on fire. Gotta go. Peace out. Yeah. I wouldn't have done that in the first place. So going back was pretty hard to swallow. And I do think the whole bunny going back for the bunny, the (laughs) heroism of going back for the bunny was the tie and maybe was a little bit flimsy one. Mm -hmm. Um, But it didn't bother me because as soon as they got back, the conversation that they had after that was so fascinating. And then once again, we're, we're... we're back in that tailspin, but having had that conversation, we're questioning ourselves. Are we friends or are we not? Yeah. Are they weird or are they aspirational? Mm-hmm. Are they a little bit of both? And are they both at the same time? Mm-hmm. I was able to overlook a bit of that. Yeah, me too. I think but I think because of just how well this movie was sort of paced and and again, like maybe not going back for the bunny, but every other moment. I kind of was like, yeah, I, I would have done that too. Like, I would have gone along with this. I would have paid the bill when he rudely just told us to. Like, I would have, like, let him drink drive home. Like, all of that stuff, you know? It's like, I'm too worried about social awkwardness not to do all of those things that he did, you know? Well, isn't that the thing when you meet some irresponsible fucking schmuck where on the one hand, you're like, ew, but on the other hand, you're kind of like, I wish. I wish I could be so <laughs> liberated as to not give a fuck to wear uh, uh, jogging pants to Walmart. I don't know. I'm trying to think of an example. But you know, like the, there's yeah. always a bit of admiration. There's yeah. always a bit of a... And I feel like that carries through. Like, yeah, I feel weird being in the shower while someone's peeing, but why? Like, maybe I'm the one who's uptight. Mm, mm-hmm. Yeah. That think, indictment occurs again and again throughout. Totally. And it's a great, it is a great way. It's a great film in that regard that kind of holds up a mirror to all of our weird bullshit, I suppose, and sort of go, why are we like that? Especially when you don't yet know these people could be completely harmless and maybe there is nothing sinister in the same way as the invitation. And you go, oh, actually, are we all just very judgmental about these kinds of things? And it actually is ridiculous when Louise complains that your bed wasn't big enough, that you were inappropriate at the restaurant, that you played your music too loud in the car. It's like, hang on, these things are ridiculous. course like those things the way in which they push this couple escalates so it starts off with a few you know micro aggressive things making the vegetarian eat meat when she doesn't want to to drink driving them home to making them pay the bill at their favorite restaurant after they've been really inappropriate and antisocial throughout the whole meal like all these little things where they're pushing this couple as far as they can go just to see if they can push them and of course like all of those things absolutely fill me with anxiety because I, I probably would have reacted in the same way as that couple did. I probably would have gone along with it. Um, and it kind of says, like, this is where things lead to, right? And it does obviously get very, very extreme by the end. But that first half where it is just like this this couple kind of going, well, we're not okay with this stuff, but actually, why aren't we okay with it? Maybe we just need to live and let live, you know? Yeah. To have to have Bjorn have this meltdown about I feel too constrained, I feel claustrophobic, when in fact firmer rules that govern behavior 
would have benefited the situation. You know, like we look back on the Victorian era and be like, I'd never want to live like that where it was so restrictive and you had to do this and you had to say that or else it was, well, you know, the flip side is normlessness. Mm. The flip side is, you know, what Durkheim termed anomie and, and people feel lost when they don't know what to do. And it's a deeply disturbed um, feeling that's hard to put your finger on. And so I think it's so powerful that we've got these two horror f- movies that put its finger right on it. Yeah, it's so, and they're both so well observed in that way. Do you think, we talked about this kind of inevitability with The Invitation, that it was kind of hurtling towards this point. Do you, do you get that with this movie? Do you think that what happened to these guys was inevitable at the end? Or, you know, in the line that he says, because you let me, like, could it have been avoided, do you think? Could they have actually got away safely had they just been honest and said, we're going to go now or whatever, you know? Well, that's interesting, Mike. And I've been thinking about that. So maybe I'll ask you, the vehicular breakdown at the end, when everything comes to a head, do you pin that on Patrick and Karen? Yeah, I can't work out that either and I, and I wonder whether that is another slightly ropey moment of the script there that idea of you know they finally get away and then what happens they suddenly just kind of like swerve off the road and break down and I don't know I kind of feel like they could have found a better way to get to that point where they're stuck in the middle of the road at night you know um, but it is interesting I don't know because I think in comparison to uh, you know David and Eden in The Invitation I feel like these two they don't have everything planned out in the way that the invitation has everything planned out to the nth degree. They know exactly how that dinner party is going to go and how they're going to kill them all. This movie, it feels a little bit like they roll with the punches and they, they this couple want to see how far they can push their victims and see and, and sort of play with them and toy with them and see if they can get them to stay as part of their kind of like... As they, they sort of get off on it almost, right? And I think that actually would they have let them get away or or were they always going to kill them? Because it it feels like they give them a lot of chances to get away, you know? I feel feel like that's what's chilling about it. I feel like if Bjorn and his family had have just spirited themselves away during the night, it would have been no harm, no foul. They never would have spoken to Patrick and Karen again. Patrick and Karen would have not... They would have never hurt for that. It's not like they're in the same community and word spreads that, oh, they drive drunk. Oh, did you hear they're really weird to their kid? Oh, did you hear? Uh, But if they had gotten away scot-free, it would have just been, oh, well, that didn't work out. On to the next. Life went on. And I I, I think the fact that they had opportunities to leave and maybe it was just a speck of bad luck that things got to where it did maybe that just kind of adds to that nihilism that adds to that oh so close that adds to the what that like what is their motivation was it like this from the start or did they just decide they were the ones later on i think that's part of the deliciousness and the ending you've mentioned we've touched upon it already but the ending it works for you does it like again it's it- oh my god <laughs> i'm so glad because again like that ending is so extreme that I do worry that I, I, I was like, is it going to lose you? Like, there's, it, there's something so over the top and, like you said, medieval about what they do to them at the end, right? But I, I, I am fully affected by that ending. Like, it works for me. I'm affected by it. And on reflection, like I said, it's on brand with what we know of mm. these two. Uh, mm-hmm. They are devoid of compassion. They are devoid of... Um, yeah, they're just... Uh, yeah. They're just, they're very carefree and, well, there's a ditch right here and there's a bunch of stones. Let's, let's do it that way. It's handy. It was easy because you let me. And the, the, the speak no evil thing is interesting as well, isn't it? Like, I haven't really <laughs> asked you about this and I've not even really sort of pro- like formed a thought about this myself, but like, why are they doing what they're doing? Why are they... St- why are they taking children and cutting out their tongues? Like, it's not like, you know, we've talked earlier on this series, actually, about Wes Craven's The People Under the Stairs and that film about these kind of mad people that, you know, kidnap children and if they... Because they're very religious and they're like, if you hear evil or speak evil, you know, they cut off bits. These people don't seem like that. Like, why are they doing what they're doing to these children? And why is the film called Speak No Evil? Like, have you got any thoughts on that? Speak No Evil, I just took... As, you know, um, they took out the tongues. And so, like, you know, yeah. there's that there's that scene where Abel kind of approaches Bjorn and is like, 
and he oh can't say anything. He can't speak any. And again, it is such a simple and brutal way to make sure that the surviving person doesn't spill a word of this. Um, yes. But yes, yes, yes. but you're right. I was kind of looking for some motive in terms of are these children being sex trafficked? Are they being... Right. Um, and all I can really think of is, is, <laughs> is, is that they are... Um, like set pieces for we're a lovely family so that they can mm. continue doing that. And so maybe yeah. it's, it's less about the children being the goal and um, the torture and the play and the fun of the chase being the goal. That absolutely makes sense. They're just getting off on what they're doing to people, aren't they, I think? Because you're right, because they have absolutely no interest in being parents, I don't no, think, really. I don't they think couldn't so. give a fuck about their children, right? So, like, yeah, which, again, makes it all the more <laughs> terrifying for those children, right? But, yeah. yeah. What a they're bleak... just disposable props to uh, to make the pretty picture of this family, which is part of the seduction, which is how they're able to get people like Bjorn in the first place. You're so right about that. And I guess maybe, as well, thinking about it, that speak no evil kind of relates to this idea of the fact that you know Bjorn didn't say anything he didn't speak up throughout this whole film he didn't do what he needed to do or say what he needed to say to get them out of yeah. that as well in a way it's that kind of speak no evil be polite you're you know and this is where politeness gets you basically in this movie so yeah, yeah. um I want to finish by asking your thoughts it was announced in April of 2023 that Blumhouse are remaking speak no evil uh, with James McAvoy attached to star and James Watkins writing and directing. James Watkins, who uh, who wrote Eden Lake uh, and also wrote and directed The Woman in Black. How are you feeling about this news, Andrea? Bummed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Also, uh, th- I, there's no way that an American remake of this movie is going to be as brutal as, as this one, you know? Look. There are American movies that I love, but there are few American remakes that I love. And just as you and I have spent so much time dissecting the ambiguity of this film that makes it so delicious, I have no faith that a Blumhouse film is going to let those ambiguities slide. I think these things are going to be explained away for one, and maybe they'll be very good explanations, but I don't want them. No. I know it's a very str- I don't under well I do understand it it's mu- it's money orientated right but I'm just like this movie's just come out I mean it's we've just got it and and uh, and yeah we're getting this remake next year 2020 well um, I suppose who knows now with the strikes but it was it's slated for a 2024 release so Will you go see it? Of course. Yeah. <laughs> of course. Of course. I love a good hate watch. Oh, we'll all go see it. We'll all complain about it. I can't wait. I can't wait. <laughs> but I'm so gl- I'm so glad, Andrea, that you enjoyed Speak No Evil because it's... I'm it's, so glad you introduced it to me, Mike. Thank it's so, you. so good. I'm so glad. Well, um, that leaves me to my final couple of questions then, um, which, first of all, I've got to ask you, you know, we've been talking about home invasion this whole time. What is your favorite home invasion movie? I think Funny Games mm. is is gonna is is gonna take um, is gonna take the title. Um, yeah, it is home invasion at its peak because it is so invasive on so many levels. It is invasive to the characters. It is invasive to the audience in the breaking of the third wall, and uh, it's it, it's all these themes that we've talked about with these two movies. Turned up to 11 with a dash mm. of absurdity that makes me feel even more unsafe. Uh, one of yes. my favorite films of all time and one of the best home invasion films, I think. The original, do you mean? the uh, the Because the, yes. there's like the shot for shot remake as well, isn't there? But, yes. Yes, yes, that, yes. I don't I don't address that. I, no. I speak no evil. You don't talk about it. <laughs> yeah. Excellent choice. Um, and What's finally, your favorite? Uh, my favorite home invasion. It's a really tricky one. I would like... In terms of traditional home invasion, have you ever seen, this is something I watched for the first time um, doing this series, have you ever seen Lady in a Cage from 1962 or something like that? No. No, I have not. It's so good. It was introduced to me by our friend Stacey Ponder. She came on the podcast ah. to talk about it with me. And it stars Olivia de Havilland. And it, it's almost in this like 
quote unquote hag exploitation kind of it's it's almost in that kind of ilk, but it's about a woman this rich woman in this house who is um she can't walk and she has to use a little elevator to get up and down uh, the stairs. It stops halfway down. There's a power cut. She's trapped in this little elevator. And then people break into her house and shit starts happening. And the whole movie is just her trapped in this little cage while all of these dangerous people are in her house. It was so good, Andrea. And I watched it and I was like, how have I never seen this movie? How have more people not been talking about this movie to wow. me? Um, so, yeah, if you get a chance, check it out. It's a it's a, it's a like forgotten classic, I think. Great. So, so good. Thanks. Um, um, so, and then finally, um, what I always love to ask all my new guests, what is your favorite horror movie? Oh, you like to ask people that? Yeah, because everyone always uh, replies in the way that you just did, which is Mike, like, what if the it fuck? was a Victorian <laughs> etiquette book of how to interact with other horror fans, I do know. you ask your friends with kids which one is their favorite? Do you? <laughs> I know it's a cruel question and I know it can change from day to day what are you feeling today Andrea what's your favorite horror movie today I'm looking down at uh, my tattoo and I'm feeling my love for the shining oh excellent choice excellent choice Uh, Doctor Sleep did you like Doctor Sleep the sequel it was all right it was all right wasn't it I thought it was a little saccharin it was better than I thought but uh, the idea of Danny being this do-gooder palliative care guy yeah I would have wanted that to get a little bit darker. Yeah, I, I'm not sure Kubrick would have enjoyed that element so much. No. <laughs> um, amazing. Well, Andrea, thank you um, so much for, for joining me. It's been such a pleasure to have you on. And just remind people, like, where can where and when can they expect the next issue of Room Org? Because actually, as well, we have a lot of UK listeners, but people in the UK can also check out Room Org, can't they? Yes, we do ship worldwide from mm. our base location in Toronto, Canada. I would love to have a UK distributor. If you are in that line of work, <laughs> yes. call me. Let's work <laughs> something out. But Room Org is available online. We also have a digital edition, and we've just started an audio digest um, just for more uh, accessibility across the board. So definitely go check us out at ru-morg.com. So by the time this episode airs, the September-October double issue of the magazine will be on shelves and available at ru-morg.com. It is a technophobia special issue. Ooh, so our perfect. cover story, uh, we're talking to Franklin Rich, Gerard Johnstone, um, the filmmakers behind a new J-horror documentary. We talk about technophobia phobia and film we talk about ai and technophobia and film um it's a really special issue it's our 26th anniversary issue so uh, oh my god yeah congratulations Thank that's you. amazing long live print media right that's amazing god bless well andrea Subasati, it's been an absolute pleasure thank you so much for joining me thank you mike this was a pleasure thank you for bearing with me and making this schedule work and i hope we can do this again sometime it was great And that's it for this week. Thank you so much for listening. And one more time, a huge thank you to my brilliant guest, Andrea Supersati. That's a real bucket list moment, getting her on the podcast. So thrilled to finally have her here. Hopefully, she'll be back again in the future. So let us know what you thought of this week's episode and what you think of these two films. Do you love them as much as Andrea and I? I would love to hear your thoughts. Please do get in touch. You can email me, evolutionofhorror at gmail.com. You can also find us on all the social Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Letterboxd, etc. And if you want to discuss this week's episode with fellow listeners, you can join the Evolution of Horror Discord or you can join the Evolution of Horror Discussion Group, which can be found on Facebook. If you want to support this podcast and get treated to regular bonus episodes every single week, then sign up to our Patreon, patreon.com slash evolution of horror. We are currently in the middle of a special Halloween double bill in which Stacey Ponder and I count down our as voted for by patrons, the top 50 horror performances of all time. So if you want to check that out, as well as a back catalogue of hundreds of other bonus episodes, then sign up. Patreon.com slash evolution of horror. You can find this podcast in all the usual podcast places. And if you get a spare moment, I'd be so grateful if you could drop us a little rating and review on Apple Podcasts, as that always helps us get discovered by new listeners. So... 
on to next week then and we are we are hurtling our way towards the end of our home invasion season but we've still got a handful of gems from the last 10 years to cover next week is a very exciting double bill because next week it's time for some mike flanagan i am going to be joined by my very good friend and longtime friend of this pod anna bogutskaya and we are going to be discussing a mike flanagan home invasion double bill that's hush from 2016 and gerald's game from 2017 cannot wait join us next week for all of this and more on the evolution of horror 